nightmare. Nightmare. You can't hide from the evil within. Within. But you can listen to some maniacs talk about it tonight on. On. No, you're supposed to say B movie mania. Oh, I'm supposed to say B movie mania. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I thought we, I thought we all say B movie mania. All right, every, everybody, everybody say B. Wait, now I just, I just say on. Yeah. Okay. This is a great cut. I'm glad this is the one you left in. <laughs> yep. <laughs> this is really getting used. Just say B movie mania, please. B movie mania. B movie mania, please. Welcome to the crossroads of camp, the bastion of the bazaar, the place where low budgets meet high praise. Yes, it's B-Movie Mania. And now, B-Movie Maniacs, here are your hosts, the cream of the crap, the connoisseurs of cult, your cinematic creepy uncles, Paul Brooks, Mike Hayes, Jason Hulls, and Crazy Chris Hudson. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to another episode. Perhaps, perhaps, a very scary episode of B-Movie Mania. I'm your host for the evening, Paul A. Brooks. And joining me per usual is Mike Hayes. Hey, Paul. Yeah. When you're sleeping at night, I'm the one who whispers in your ear. Oh, God. You know, I'm okay with that, actually. Uh, and we got Chris Hudson. Wrecked him? It fucking killed him! Oh, my God. <laughs> and, of course, Jason Hulse. Hey, Paul. Uh, Mike's crawling. Uh, Mike, where did you say you were again when he sleeps? <laughs> I'm, I'm whispering in his ear. Oh, I'm the one crawling inside your back. Oh, cool. <laughs> huh. Okay, well. Uh, the Evil Within. This is a film that was written and directed by a man named Andrew Getty, who is an heir to the Getty Oil Empire. And it stars Frederick Kohler, Michael Berryman, Sean Patrick Flannery and Chris, I know you're a big Dynamire fan, right? Oh, totally, totally. Yeah. Um, origin originally titled "The Storyteller," which I wish they would have kept. The film was a personal project of of Getty, who largely self financed the estimated cost of four to six million dollars of the production. This movie took fifteen years to complete because sadly Andrew Getty died in 2015 uh, before the film was finished at which point uh, editing was completed by producer Michael Luceri. Is that why it took 15 years? Because he died 13 years into it? Yeah, it's 13 years is still too long. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I guess production was from 2002 to 2008. Took about six years to shoot it. Didn't he also die because of complications from his meth addiction? So that could have had something to do with the I'm, whole... I'm pretty sure that had a lot to do with the whole movie, Jay. Yeah. And... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then after 2008, basically from 2008 until he died, he was tinkering with it and editing with it and supposedly just like going frame by frame trying to perfect it. And it, it he just couldn't quite get there. That level of attention and detail really, really shows through in this one, though. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And for once, I don't mean that sarcastically. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. Appreciate that. Quick takes. Quick takes! Let's start with Jay, because I have a feeling that Jay's take on this movie might be interesting. So, I was into this at first. Um, <laughs> it's got a unique opening, um, some very interesting visuals. But there is a part in the movie, which I can say now or later, but there's a part that I found so 
Uh, it, it turned me off so much. I stopped taking notes for the first time ever. I've never done that. <laughs> and I almost, I like considered just not watching it. Like I tuned out so hard. I, I, I just, I was like, I'm done. So there you go. Mike Hayes. <laughs> Look, Paul, you're not going to itemize the way I disappoint you. Okay. <laughs> Be a callback to the film. Yeah. Chris. <laughs> <laughs> well, Paul, to paraphrase Dennis, a quick take is a take I tell myself, right? <laughs> um, I suppose that's one way to look at it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I like that how you, where you're sitting, Paul, when you're recording this and we're, we're looking at each other in our, our Google chat. There's a mirror behind you. Uh oh. Oh, shit. Is that, is that Michael Berryman? <laughs> <laughs> I got to watch my back in here. <laughs> yeah. God damn. Um, ah, oh gosh. I mean, where to begin? Um, the very opening shot of this movie is, I think, one of the strangest, like, openings I've ever seen. And that's the strange part. Yeah, well, the whole thing is very strange, but right out of the gate, we get very, very, very strange. Hey, can I, can I just say real quick, I never got to tell myself my quick take? Oh. That's, uh, yeah, go ahead. This movie's fucking weird. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. Very astute <laughs> observation. Can we talk, though, about this opening shot? Because I thought this was crazy awesome. Yeah, I mean, you're talking about, like, how parts of the frame keep changing? Mm. Yeah, it's, it's everything sort of morphs from one thing into another. There's, like, it starts out in Andrew Getty's actual Hollywood mansion is where a lot of this movie was shot. Hmm. And you, there's, there's, like, a baby in an old stroller with like a small TV on a stand or something. And there's a old lady in a pink chair, like an inflatable chair. And then everything starts like morphing into all this different stuff. There's, there's like plates on a table. And for some reason they turn into hats and like, and there's like, like a Captain America shield in the middle. Yeah. Yeah. There's the, it looks pretty good. Like, honestly, the cinematography throughout and, like, the use of CGI and the way it's used and uh, whatnot is uh, pretty effective and looks, you know, they don't look realistic. They're stylized. And yeah, I think they're it's stylized stylistic. in a way. But it still works. It really works the whole time. This whole movie is about Andrew Getty's real life dreams that he had when he was younger. And so the beginning of this is a lot of his, a lot of imagery from seemingly his his dreams so so we get this scene chris you want to talk about it where where we get the carnival scene here oh yeah it's just uh this old abandoned carnival there's no one there it's just dennis and his mom dream dennis as a kid and his mom and visiting this carnival and all the carnival barkers with their rigged games and well and it's in the middle of the desert in the middle of the desert yeah which is yeah, a cool visual mom we gotta go we gotta go on the haunted house ride are you sure? It says right on the marquee is the scariest one in the world. Of course I'm sure. We have to, have to, have to. Yeah, it was a really cool visual. And But through all this, Dennis just really wants to see the little haunted house ride, which is a total ripoff. I mean, they got ripped off by the idiots who live there. I mean, they <laughs> really, they really should get their money back. Yeah, and uh, this is sort of one of the scenes where Andrew Getty's money comes into play because this is not Mike. This is not CGI. This is really somehow he put the uh, full carnival in, like way out in he, the salt he, flats or he something. He put a desert in his backyard. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's in a mansion. Wow. He put a desert on the grounds of his mansion. I was trying to figure out if there was some CG involved there, but it looks like he it legit looked, yeah, got a carnival yeah. to go out into the salt flats. Mom, we should get our money back. She turned to me very slowly and said, What makes you think the ride's over? What makes you think it's ever gonna end? What makes you think the ride is over? Oh, shit. <laughs> this was a pretty cool visual. When, when he says something like about the ride and how it wasn't scary, and then it's what Chris just said. The mom takes the, her sunglasses off and her eyes are mouths. Uh, and then we get sort of like, it's just a bunch of dreams. I, I, I was wondering if some of this could have been done without 
so much narration. Oh, I do get the yeah. function of it. I know what they were trying to do with it because when he wakes up from his dreams, he's a very different person than he is in his dreams with the narration. So there's a and, there's a sort of a double thing going on there. And mm-hmm. it's the yeah. and it's the type of narration that like reads better like on a page. It yeah, maybe definitely. works, but like, when you say it out loud, it totally doesn't work. It's very wordy. And again, I I think I know what they're going for. Yeah, yeah. Um because throughout the film, the character talks about, oh, you know, my brother uses these 50-cent words and blah, 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 and he can't do it. And uh, so in his dreams, he is this super smart version of himself that he might have been when he, before tragedy struck. But I just wondered, as a viewer, looking at this thing cold, I think some of that narration could have been taken out, and it would have been just as, if not more, effective. I bet this narration was like a sh- couple short stories he wrote before filming this thing possible I, I mean i couldn't even tell you any of it it, it just no. all blends after i a thought while. i thought there was some interesting poetic like phrases and stuff like that uh mm-hmm. for the most part i didn't want to hear any more of the narration because narration is boring a lot of the time but i mean and it goes on like for like 10 minutes yeah but i kept being brought dr- brought back into it because there was some interesting and creative turns of phrase and i liked that mm-hmm. Hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah i'm usually not a fan of narr- narration in general but I think since this entire project is so autobiographical, um, I talked about this a little bit in my teaser. I think the whole movie for Andrew Getty was his attempt to sort of get his nightmares out of his head and sort of into into the world to maybe help s- some other people understand him. That's totally just my well, take on it. I, my guess. I read I read an interview with the main actor uh, Fred. I forget his last name. Um, he said that John he, Moxley. He, yeah, John. <laughs> Smaller, <laughs> uh, less in shape, John Moxley. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. No, he said that. Uh, he said that he was playing Getty. That's the how he right. played it. That was the impression he got to the whole the whole thing. Yeah, Frederick Kohler is his Frederick name. Cole, and, yeah. and yeah, I, I, I read something similar where he said that Andrew Getty in directing this film was very specific. Like he was very clear, which is not surprising if you watch the movie. He had a very specific vision for what he wanted to do. So I think a lot of the choices that were made, even in uh, Frederick Kohler's character of Dennis, our main character here, probably a lot of that had to do with Andrew Getty's direction, I would assume. And look at him now. He went on to win the AEW world title. That's not him. That's okay. Uh, I have to ask the hard question then, saying that. Yep, yep. W- was An- Andrew Getty handicapped in some way? Yeah, I, uh, I was wondering about that. As far as I'm aware, no. Cause yeah, let's just tie this all together with what Dennis is when he wakes up. You're going to have to get used to the way I speak out loud. My inner voice is considerably more sophisticated. John, this chicken was good, but we didn't bring any ice cream. Yeah, Dennis is handicapped. He's like, mentally challenged. Mentally challenged. I, I couldn't tell you exactly what. They use some choice words that are uh, inappropriate. I'm not going to I can tell them. you one that is that they use all the time through the movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, I think that this is a product of the 15-year production span. No. Nope. <laughs> not well, that word. I, nope. Yeah. It, it wasn't a 50-year production, Paul. <laughs> no, but if you go back and you watch movies from 2002 to 2006, guarantee you there's going to be a lot more of that kind of talk in certain movies. That's that's true, and that, that factors into stuff, too. Cause, yeah. yeah. But What I was referring to earlier, in, in his dreams, Dennis speaks very eloquently. Yeah. And he has a great diction, we'll say. And... In real life, he's mentally challenged, and he can't talk like that. So I think the reason that that narration is there is to purposely show sort of what's going on in Dennis's mind versus, you know, in his unconscious self versus what he is consciously. Right. You can't run in a nightmare. Not with atrophied muscles over tungsten bones, not through the gelatinous atmosphere, not from him. But I wanted to touch on one more of these uh, nightmares early on in the movie where Dennis is in bed and we get some Michael Berryman action here. Uh, 
<laughs> who mentioned this in their in their in their opening? Who wants to talk about it? The the, the troll toll scene. I think it was you, Jay, wasn't it? Did I talked about naked Michael Berryman. Crawl. Oh, well, I did. Yes. Yeah. Um, so you think he's awake, but then naked Michael Berryman. I guess he looks kind of trollish. Like he <laughs> unzips Dennis's back and starts crawling into his back. And again, visually, I mean, it's pretty intense. Like I'll give it to yeah. Him. Well, not only that, he puts the zipper on him. Like, he spikes yeah. it into his back. And then, yeah, yeah, yeah. through dream logic, the zipper then becomes part of Dennis. And he unzips him and crawls in and wears him like a dentist suit. Yeah. <laughs> Much like I do with Paul when he's sleeping. Yeah, whoa. <laughs> Hashtag dentist suit. Um, <laughs> yeah, and if that's his dreams, yikes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. He probably should have just done a, a handful of shorts. I'm going to say, because because this is where this is where the steam runs out for me after this scene. Yeah. You know, I, that's a great point, Mike. Like yeah. if he if he channeled this. OK, we keep talking about how these are his real dreams, much like Akira Kurosawa's dreams. <laughs> that film was taken directly from his dreams. Maybe maybe Getty should have uh, pulled off something like that. Some sort of format like that. Who knows some what sort of anthology. Yeah. yeah, because I, this correct me if I'm wrong, but this movie is not well known, right? Um, well, I mean, it definitely got some press when it came out because of who made it. Okay, you know, there's there's been a lot of stuff that has gone on with the Getty family in terms of controversies and like, I don't want to get too deep into it, but like, there's been some kidnappings in the past and like some crazy, crazy shit with the family history. Mm -hmm. So when he died, it was pretty big news. And then when this movie came out, it got some press. Okay. Well, I just wonder how he would have been viewed had he took, taken this different format that, that Mike is and, and I are, are pitching. Well, sadly, we will never know. No, we won't. Um, well, we get introduced here to Dennis's brother, John who is uh, played by Sean Patrick Fl Flannery, who takes care of him and lives with him in this big mansion. And we get this scene where Chris, John surprises Dennis with a mirror for some reason. I'm not exactly sure why. <laughs> uh, you know, well, okay. The it only goes way, with the house. Yeah, the, only, <laughs> the only way I can think of make this work together <clears throat> is that it's Sean Patrick Fl Flannery young Indiana Jones. So he went off on some sort of archaeological adventure and came back with this mirror. I guess through like some sort of like prohibition era vault. Yeah. Takes this mirror, thinks it goes great with the house and decides to surprise his brother with a completely inappropriate gift and moving all his shit out of the way and here's your new mirror, brother. <laughs> well, and he puts it right God. in the middle of the room. Oh my God. It's like he's a just a fucking dick. Anyway, I don't like this mirror and I don't want it in this room. Dennis, look at the shape of this frame. Compared to the shape of the window, it's the same kind of wood stained with the same kind of stain. It matches the character of the house perfectly. Yeah, he's a dick about it because the because the kid. Well, sorry, I thought it was dad and son for the for most of the movie because there is a <laughs> twenty year age difference between the two, so they're not brothers. But the dad guy is so mad about it, like the boondock scene. <laughs> yeah, the boondock. Dennis scene. is like flipping out. He obviously doesn't want it, and obviously Dennis, you know, has some emotional issues and shit because he doesn't feel understood and all that stuff. And the and and uh, John is his name, is just pissed. Just it's from a vault, you know, blah blah blah. Just like angrily yelling at him. And I I, I hope I wanted him to I want him to die because he sucks. <laughs> I saw the really, mirror really, really, and I hated really, it Dennis, even Dennis, then. When right was when this? I saw when was this? It. Last night. The mirror wasn't even in the house last night. It was in town getting restored for you. No, it's not for me. You just want to get rid of my hamsters. Can I bring up what I feel is a real missed opportunity here? Yeah. Dennis is very concerned when this mirror comes into the room because he has all these, like, habit trail things all over his room for his hamsters. And there are these tunnels going all over this big room. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, for sure that's going to be a thing. Like... Mm. There's this all this dream logic, and even later we see Berryman, the, who is a demon, crawling through different mirror spaces, and I'm like, this is really it could be a metaphor or something. And they really didn't do anything with the hamsters well, no, or the, Jay, the tunnels. Jay, no, I I beg to disagree. There is okay. a line that Sean Patrick Flannery <laughs> says that line. relates directly to what you're saying. 
And that line, Paul, if you want to put it here, <laughs> the, the hamsters really smell bad and the mirror looks really good. Dennis, your hamsters really smell bad. And the mirror really looks good. <laughs> Can't argue with that. <laughs> I stand corrected. I... <laughs> you show the yeah. hamsters in act one, you talk about them in act one. <laughs> that Chekhov's uh, hamster. I, I think trail. later in Act One, he does yell, "You just want to take away my hamsters or something." So, well, yeah. But my point is that it's, it's the tunnels itself that I thought was going to be metaphorical because there's so much dream stuff and all. That. I'm like, this is going to get used, but it didn't. Well, maybe you should do more meth, Jay, and make a yeah, movie. There we go. Fine. <laughs> Although, Fine. Jay, if you did more meth, there might be more spiders in your movies. Oh yeah, I'll put yes. spiders in my movies. I'll show you. I'll do meth right now. But there was there was some crazy um like the camera cuts like moves from from Dennis and John and then like somehow goes through these tiny little tunnels. I guess they built like custom camera rigs to get some of these shots and they're pretty sweet. Yeah. Well, I wanted to talk about that a little bit too. I'm not as into camera work as you guys might be, but I thought the camera work was really good through the entire movie. Yeah, yeah. it really was. Yeah. Um and yeah, so Dennis is not happy about this mirror, partially because he did see it in one of his previous dreams. It's the same mirror. So he's, it kind of sets him off a little bit for good reason. And the mirror, almost immediately, Dennis's reflection starts talking back to him. No matter how many long 50 cent words he uses, he can't tell me to like you. I like you. I like you a lot. Mm -hmm. It's a very Smeagol type of situation yeah. as well. Yeah. It starts out not as obvious, right? It, at first, it starts out as if they're just, he's talking back and forth, these two entities of himself, but they are very similar at first. But as things progress in the, in the film and the certain tasks that have been given to him are completed, he becomes more and more both mentally and physically uh, un- challenged or whatever yeah, right mike i really appreciate the way you phrase that it makes it sound like he's doing the 12 tasks of hercules or something yes he oh he's doing the 12 tasks of legion <laughs> oh yeah find out. there we go so uh we got to talk about mildy here for a second real quick she is a social services worker who stops by the mansion to check on dennis and and to talk to john about his temper chris is it going out on a limb to say that this is the, the she is the worst social service worker of, of all time? <laughs> yeah, based on well, she she tells John that um, he's not a very good caretaker of Dennis, and that he's angry and he's prone to violence and all this stuff. Where she's basically goading him into what she's talking about. Social services can remove a child from a suspect parent on the strength of one anonymous phone call. Okay, okay so let me get this straight. I can make a phone call about anyone at random without giving my name and a person like you will show up at their door and remove their children? That's right. And we don't know who ratted on him, basically. Someone called her because she doesn't know, right. but she won't All, tell him, obviously. Also, also, she is willing to break whatever laws she can to get Dennis. Mm -hmm. I thought it was, they were going to reveal that Dennis called on his brother. Mm. Yeah, I thought so, too. Uh, but we get introduced here to John's girlfriend, Lydia. Uh, Dinah Meyer, who you may, some of you may know from uh, Starship Troopers. Dizzy. Or, uh, Dizzy, yeah. Or uh, Commander Dinatra from Star Trek Nemesis. Hell yeah. Now, hey, so we, we've, had, uh, we've had a movie with Denise Richards from Starship Troopers. Of course. Now we have a movie with Dizzy from Starship Troopers. Can we just get somebody to pick a Casper Van Dien movie at some point here? <laughs> Jay? I think I might make you happy pretty soon. Oh, God damn it. Uh -oh. <laughs> uh -oh. We're just going to have to wait a few weeks to find out. <laughs> <laughs> a few weeks, maybe next year. We'll see. Okay. Jay, also um, don't forget, we have done a Michael Ironside movie. That's true. All right. We are really yeah. hitting the Starship Trooper. Ooh, we got to do Clancy Brown, too, though. Clancy Brown and uh, uh, Neil Patrick Harris. Yeah. <laughs> and Jake <Busey. laughs> Jake, Jake Busey. Busey. Damn it. Oh, I, got a, a I got a Jake Busey movie I want to do if uh, it ever streams. But. Yeah, so so Lydia wants to put Dennis into a, a, a home or a hospital thing, right? And Well, it's more about he, she, she wants to marry John, but she, 
She yeah. doesn't want to live with Dennis is what it boils down to. <laughs> yeah, she yeah. wants a family, but not that kind of family. You're never going to marry me, John, are you? You've got the perfect excuse to stay single and not look like a cat. You've got Dennis. Yeah, and they, they hint at, like, uh, John owing Dennis. Which you don't get something. to hear about until much later in the movie. Much later. Yeah. Which I found is another compu- confusing part of the movie. There's There seems to be a little bit of competing origin story, backstory mm. stuff. Yeah. As you get into um, it. We got a great scene here that I just wanted to touch on because I thought, again, that it was shot really cool where Dennis uh, is upset about uh, all this stuff with Lydia and he goes into his bedroom and it turns into this like labyrinth of mirrors. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, This was a moment that actually got me because um, he's he's scared and he's sort of creeping around these mirrors and he's touching the mirrors. And at one point. He touches Michael Michael Berryman's hand. It like comes out of nowhere, and I actually gasped when that happened because it scared me. <laughs> oh, yeah. So I thought that that was a really well shot scene, and then it just ends up being sort of another one of these nightmares that he gets stuck I, in. But I believe it really it's a cool. shot by shot remake of the end of uh, Touch of Evil. Touch of Evil, a little bit of Zardoz in there yeah. as well, maybe the uh, yeah, yeah. Tabernacle. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We have to stop the nightmares. <laughs> How can we stop the nightmares? We have to fix our brain. But Dennis is upset with these, with all these nightmares that he's having, and this is where we get the mirror demon, if you will, uh, telling Dennis through the mirror that he has a way to stop all of these nightmares. Uh, Mike, what does <laughs> what does Dennis? Need to do according to his uh, mirror friend kill here a cat. in order to, yeah. yeah. Hey, Paul, he does Dennis jump in, man? Yeah, he doesn't just God. kill one; he's got a whole cooler full by yeah, the oh afternoon. <laughs> yeah, Paul, this... what's what's with these cat killing movies that you Jeez. seem to pick? Well, uh, what other cat Ugh. killing? What are we talking Two about? Two evil eyes. Two evil eyes. Oh yeah. wow, jeez, that really sticks with you, huh? Yeah, that movie fucking <laughs> blew. <laughs> it well, what sticks great. with me more is that you keep picking uh, movies where. People and animals get tortured. Yeah. A lot of torture porn. Yeah. You gotta go kill a kitty cat. You're the torture porn B-movie maniac, Paul. Okay. In my well, defense, I ne- I didn't ever see Two Evil Eyes before I picked it. Um, I hadn't ho- seen this one for a long time. Let me see. That. Um, hold on. I'm looking up Paul's U-porn search uh, uh-huh. history here. Uh-huh. Uh, oh, yeah, gee. No, can't say any of these on the air Oof. here. Wow. <laughs> okay. All wow. right, I'll, t- I'll take the rib. You know, it's one thing being everyone's favorite B-movie maniac. It's another one to be the torture porn B-movie maniac. <laughs> hey, you know what? Let me tell you something. In, like, 2005, when I was living with Mike in Normal, Uh-oh. we went to the video store, and he introduced me to a movie called Uninvited, and that's what got me started <laughs> on... Uh, oh. Not all cats have radioactive alien cats inside yeah, of them, but, Paul. But that's, oh, some no. are fine. <laughs> Mike, you're at the heart of all of this. Oh, I thought this geez. was going to take extensive therapy to get to the center of what's going on with Paul, and he just <laughs> came out with it. <laughs> we found the crux. Isn't that movie about cats killing people, though? And then Paul picks... I think he's just trying to get revenge for that? Is that what you guys are talking about? I'm no therapist. Is I'm this a, little a revenge slow. fantasy? It's revenge fantasy. That's That makes a lot more sense. So Dennis has these cassettes about taxidermy and forensics and leathering. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Gosh. He's got some books on <laughs> tape. Some taxidermy yeah. books on tape. And, <laughs> what? And I gotta, what? I gotta what say, is... I was all into this movie up until this point. Well, that's where I started getting a little uncomfortable. Oh, that's when you checked out? Well, I didn't check out, but... Uh, I'll tell you the moment yeah. I checked out. It's coming. Oh, yeah. Because my notes stop. But real quick, <laughs> what, what... Since you've worded it this way, Paul, these books on tape, what do you think... Like, a taxidermy book on tape is, because it's got to have a lot of picture instructions in it, right? So someone's got to describe shit? Uh, that's a very good question, Mike, that I do not have the answer to. I'll have to check one out. I'll talk to one of my librarian friends and see. Mike, I think that might make for a really great Thursday update. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let's hear a little bit of that. Well, let's not, yeah, actually, let's not Mike, commit if you could, anything. Well, if you could check in with uh, Pete from the bookstore, he might uh, be able to help you out a lot. <laughs> oh, yeah, Pete. I'll, Pete from the bookstore. I'll, I'll talk to Pete. Fine. Taxidermy. Forensic. Why do you have these tapes? Why do you want to know about butchery and 
leather care and taxidermy, especially forensics. Those aren't my cassettes. They got in my bag by mistake. Hey, hey, before before we get into the part where Jay checked out, can I just talk about my favorite line for the movie? Please do. Where where Lydia, the uh, girlfriend, John's girlfriend, really wants she. It's clear that she really wants to marry John, and she yeah. really wants, but she doesn't want to move in with Dennis. Because what well, she said, she wants a baby, the small kind, not the 30-year-old masturbating kind. <laughs> it's a valid point. It's a very valid point. I think it's okay with that. And now on with the part that kills Jay. Oh, boy. <laughs> um, well, uh, you know what? I'll, this, this is my burden to bear, so I'll just get through this part here. He, uh, the mirror demon tells Dennis that he's got to take the next step by going out and killing a kid. I have to kill a little boy or a little girl. It doesn't matter. It has to be a child. And he does it. <laughs> well, to, in Dennis's defense, Legion, the, the demon does give him an ultimatum. Either he does it and he lets him sleep, have very good dreams for a very long time, or he doesn't do it. And all the nightmares up to this point are just nothing compared to what he's going to go through. Right, but there was a screenwriter for this movie. Oh shit! Yes, and I forgot about that part. Yeah, there was this, there was a person who put words on the page for this and had to make this all okay. Well, Andrew and Getty. They didn't have to do that because all of this is just the construct of Getty. So Getty could have easily done this film. Okay, well, and written this in such a way so that there weren't three murdered children thrown into an ice chest. All right, number one, number one, it is not graphic in any way. You don't see anything, right? Um, right, yeah. I mean, he charges a kid with a knife, but you don't right. see, you do see him throw the dead kids into the cooler, and they yes, do come do. back later. It's not pleasant. No, it's not pleasant, and I don't think it's necessary. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to spend too much time on it, because clearly people were, were not into it for obvious reasons, but, um... Is this some sort of reflection since the entire movie is is autobiographical? Do we need to be concerned about <laughs> Andrew Getty actually having some sort of real, uh, you know, desire to do some of this stuff? Not anymore. Yeah. <laughs> not anymore, no. I hope not. I'm not yeah. familiar with wow. the family, but... or yeah. This this is where it, this really started to come. I don't know. Parents not the right word because I don't know. But it just seems kind of real edge lordy now. Like I'm gonna make things real. Like <laughs> yes, everyone hates me. Everyone thinks I'm stupid. I'm gonna go out and do this shit. You know. This is also the part where I was like, I don't care about Dennis anymore. Like you're not mm -hmm. a heroic character. You like right. I get it. You're tortured by these demons. Okay, but he doesn't even try to resist. He doesn't even say, Hey, can I just fill up a couple more coolers? Of cats, you know, which in and of itself is bad enough. He's just like, kill a kid, got it. One, how about three? Above and beyond the call of duty, Ugh. apparently. Ugh. Yes. Yeah, there's no one enjoyable in this film. No, no, that's that's one of the issues, is that, and and I think there's also definitely room for... Don't say a sequel. Don't say I'm, a sequel. I'm not the person to, to probably articulate this the best, but having a mentally challenged protagonist manipulated by this demonic force. I, I I could see some other people possibly being offended by some of these choices that are going on. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if Getty was not challenged and handicapped or whatever, it the idea that maybe he saw himself as that way is very disturbing in a way. Right, uh, but yeah. no casual viewer is going to have that context. Well, that that's where you also get into the, you know, who's who's portraying the role, all that, that kind of shit. But mm -hmm. but just the idea that if this is super autobiographical, the idea that he must have felt like no one respected him, no one thought he was smart, uh, and all this kind of stuff because he's just some rich kid. Right. That's been in a, a, a fortune for 150 years. Mm -hmm. um, he was so browbeaten by himself and others or whatever that he felt like the only way to represent or an appropriate way to represent himself and how he feels his relationship is with the world is that way is uh, is fucked up. 
Yeah. And, and I can see that like the house of cards that he built here, you know, I can see because Dennis is, is mentally challenged. The demon uses this technique. And if he wasn't mentally challenged in the movie, then the demon might not be able to, which makes this part fall apart. And so I can see the construction of the movie. I just don't like it. (laughs) Is the thing. Guys, let's take a quick break here (laughs) and check out this from our good friends over at Night Beast Industries. As the world descends into an emotional political hell and polite social discourse dips down to the lowest of lows, there is no reason you need to bring the stink to your debate's tumultuous brink. With Night Beast Industries' patented new breath ray, you won't worry about what's coming out of your mouth. We've made a way to make your spray okay. If you suspect your mouth hole smells more like a bee hole, simply place the tip of the patented breath ray against your lips and pull the fast action trigger. Patented ray technology will fill your mouth with a sparkling glimmer. That's right. Night Beast Industries has incorporated ray tracing technology into its comprehensive mouth care system. Just put the breath ray into your mouth, pull the fast action trigger, and you will never worry about bad breath again. Make your political enemies day with the Night Beast Industries breath ray. Just go to bit.ly slash nightbeast to ensure your cool mint Night Beast breath, even when you're arguing politics to the death. That's bit.ly slash nightbeast to use the breath ray to make your bad mouth day go away. Okay, very cool. Very cool. Thank you for that, Night Beast Industries, our good friends over at Night Beast Industries. Oh, hey, Paul, hold on. Sorry, I'm uh, filling up another cup of coffee here because I'm trying to wake up. Trying to wake up? What's what's, yeah. what's the issue? Well, I just it's mostly just what happened in the movie. They're trying to be awake or isn't awake, and I'm just a little sleepy, so I'll have a cup of coffee at Mike, 9.22 p.m. Who said the ride is over? <laughs> oh, that doesn't work here. <laughs> <laughs> You, sounds like you need a cup of coffee too, Jay. All right, Paul, what's up next? Uh, well, we get the demon here, Mike. You you said this earlier. Who's now calling himself Legion? Yeah, that's from the Gospel um, of Mark. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Some biblical do you want, stuff. You want one of Mike's Bible facts? I do not. He convinces Dennis to kill the girl he likes at an <laughs> ice cream shop. Um, yeah. and so we get some of that. Unfortunately, it doesn't work out too well for him. Yeah, well, he tries to kill her. This this yeah. this uh, nice looking blonde girl. Her name is Susan. He's in here now because Legion says that she's got to die. Yeah, and like Dennis, like kind of attacks her in this. Well, you know, I'm getting ahead of myself. First, he makes her write a letter. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah. Like like he God. Dic- like Dennis dictates a letter. <laughs> the just real quick the line of of she's like you're joking right he's like no why should i be joking she's like because i'd feel much more comfortable if you were is just says <laughs> right yeah says fucking bounds yep mm-hmm. anyway so he jumps out of the ceiling uh <laughs> after that and kills her i don't know how he got way. up there but he did he's, and he he's did. a fucking spider-man in this scene yeah very spider-like yeah. He, but he just chases, chases her into traffic and she's hit by a bus yeah uh, never see her again well hold on <laughs> uh, Credits? Later no, that okay. night, John and Lydia tell Dennis that he he is in charge for the night. It is Dennis's night, and they will do whatever he wants. So, uh, <laughs> Mike, what do they do? They go. He takes them to a, uh, a like we've An all awesome been to a restaurant. Chucky. No, that's the wrong description, Paul. Maybe you saw a different <laughs> movie. What I saw was a pizza place with uh, the animatronics, kind of like Chuck E. Cheese, but thirty <laughs> times more terrifying. Because there's just it, they took. It's like they took a gorilla and, and then like tore the skin off of it and made it sing a song to them. It is awful. <laughs> yeah, that combined with the. Most horrifying Long John Silvers you've ever seen. Yes, yeah, it's it's oh, it, <laughs> God well, damn it. Well, that's the second most disappointing thing I found about this movie. First thing is obviously the child murder. Second thing I was disappointed in is that I really wanted to see a Chuck E. Cheese style restaurant that served seafood. <laughs> yeah, they just uh, had pizza. the uniforms <laughs> and the theme of the animatronics were all like ocean going nautical you know yeah. let's get some fucking fish and chips in here give me some salmon <laughs> or at least like a shrimp aroni pizza or something yeah God. no chris you will have a pepperoni pizza and a strawberry milkshake and you will like it <laughs> yeah yeah Ugh, i'm never going to that place although that was a pretty cool octopus playing the drums yeah well let's talk about this for a second 
because the <laughs> animatronics <laughs> <laughs> inside <laughs> of this oh, this is strange right. mm -hmm. Chucky Long John Silvers uh, are incredible. Chucky Long John Silvers. <laughs> and apparently were all made uh, in large part by Andrew Getty himself. So it's like... Okay, we definitely need to worry about this guy now. <laughs> yeah, he's coming back. He's not actually dead. He faked no, it, man. He's yeah. in a mirror or something or something. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I love the song, though, that was playing inside of the uh, restaurant. Like, Dennis is just fucking happy as hell to be there. <laughs> They're having a great time. Well, he's getting a strawberry milkshake, and he murders a guy in the bathroom. What's not to be yeah, happy but then about? Yeah, he, he goes into the bathroom and just fucking... Axe is a guy in the head. <laughs> Takes him out quick. See, is this now? This is where things kind of started getting really weird for me. Like, what's the dream and what's the reality? Because right. he wakes up a few minutes later, just like not covered in blood, just wakes up in the booth. Right. And, well, he also saw Susan turn into yeah. a giant naked woman spider and chase him. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yes. She had boobs on her back. Yeah, yeah she had boobs on her back. On her yeah. back. Mm -hmm. The vagina was presumably somewhere. We're not sure <laughs> yeah. where. But it was, it was all there and eight legs. I saw everything. You can see now, Dennis, that my skin is the only thing that's holding me together. And it chases Dennis in in the hallway of this horrifying Long John Silvers. Yeah. That's one of the things I like, though, is that it, it is blurring the line and you're not quite sure, well, did he actually go in there and do any of that and then go back to the table and, and pass out a little bit? Or, or did he dream all of it? You know, they they do, I think, a pretty good job in, in some of this of, of blurring that line. Yes. Well, and to build on top of that, to get to add to the strangeness of this, is they're going to the ice cream place. They, you know, they it's like the woman working there looks sort of like Susan, but isn't. They go to the the bar before the uh, the incident with the giant, and everyone's either ignoring them, and they look vaguely familiar, but they're not really the same people, and they're just wondering what the fuck is going on. Where what happened? To all the faces that we know, and weren't There's they no drugged, or they thought they were drugged? They yeah, both that's woke the up after the horror Long John Silver. This, this is why I think they're sort of in the dream state now. They've been sucked into Dennis's dreams because they. Say they didn't have anything to drink, but they've hmm. got like this like, terrible hangover. Yeah, and yeah. So and everybody yeah. that they know in town is missing, except for Pete. Pete from the library. <laughs> right. So we'll get this whole bit. Yeah. It's like, what's the bit? Is it? Are they in the dream world? Is there something to this? Why is Pete the only guy they know? <laughs> but Mike, this is what you were alluding to earlier, where Legion mm -hmm. somehow pushes Dennis. I, I guess into his mirror and like switches place with him in in the real world. This is the one, like the one scene where you're like, oh, I guess Dennis isn't totally cool with doing all this bad stuff because he's like threatens to kill himself because he doesn't want to kill anyone else. Because oh, because Legion has told him he's got to kill the people that are closest to him. That's the next level, right? Right. So anyway, so he threatens to kill himself, and then this is where Legion takes the opportunity somehow to like push him into his the a mirror realm, and then Legion become comes out. Uh, I said, good. <laughs> it's my note for that scene. <laughs> and then uh, Mildy shows up, our, our social worker here, shows up at the house with two cops. Mike, played by the Sklar brothers for some reason. Well, one of them is played by a Sklar brother. The other one is not a Sklar. Okay, there's an older guy who is the other cop. But yes. what ends up happening is that, I guess Dennis, because Dennis is in the mirror now... Yeah, it well, doesn't make sense. No. The scene has absolutely nothing to do with anything. A cop comes out of the mirror. That's the other Sklar brother. They're both in it. Oh, yeah? So they one played the one played the cop, the other played the evil mirror self? Yeah. <laughs> That's, I was wondering that, because I'm like, that looks pretty good. And I'm like, did they yeah. maybe... What were they doing in the... Who, what bet thought, did they lose? I thought that was an effect. <laughs> pretty wild. So they're dead. Uh, Mildy's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone's dead. Yeah, well, I want to say real quick, though, this is a social worker with no respect for the law. Even the cops are like, we don't have a warrant. And she's like, just, just look at everything in plain sight then. Like, don't go digging for shit. Like, Which I don't think you can do. Because <laughs> they are in the house Yeah, <laughs> when they're doing it. You can't yeah. just walk in. No, that's not how the law works. <sighs> yeah. But these cops are kind of assholes, so they, you know, uh, nobody yeah. shed a tear over them getting killed. No. Right? 
No. I did. Uh, only because it was the Sklar brothers. <laughs> <laughs> Mike's a big Sklar brother fan. Uh, okay, and here we go. All right. John and Lydia are very confused because they don't recognize anybody. And Pete! Pete from the bookstore! And they spot Pete from the bookstore. Hey, it's Pete. Okay, so what's your guess? Well, Dennis is holed up in the basement with instructions for butchers and taxidermists. It smells like Satan's ass down there. People are missing. One's dead for sure. Not everyone we know is missing, okay? (laughs) Ha! There's Pete! Pete from the bookstore! Chris, I know you want to talk about this. Describe Pete from the bookstore. Oh, man, I love Pete. Pete is a guy sitting in a um, kind of an outdoor cafe. And John, like... It's totally excited to finally see someone he knows. We have not seen Pete through this entire movie. Nope, this is his no. first scene. <laughs> yeah. But John is really happy to see him. But he has my favorite line of the entire movie. <laughs> and I can't remember it verbatim, so I'm just going to put it in right here. But you know what I'm talking about, Chris? <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. Hey, yeah, I got been spending a lot of time in the basement. There's weird smells coming out of there. And stinking in the basement is okay if you're reading the right books. Exactly. Stinking in the basement is okay if you're reading the right books. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what does that mean? I don't know. Uh, oh, God. Uh, <laughs> great character. It, you can't really quite tell, but it looks like under his blazer, he's wearing a shirt that just says in red letters, fuck you. Oh, it 100% does. <laughs> I, I mean, that. That. But it's this whole thing with the with the taxidermy audiobooks where Pete has <laughs> Chuck's books that supposedly got mixed up with Dennis's. Yeah, what is this whole thing? <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> Great. Someone named Chuck. And it's and it's wrapped in butcher paper. Like he gives it to him like it's like fucking ribs he bought from the butcher. <laughs> Well, I don't know what kind of libraries you're used to, Mike. Not those ones. I call those delis. <laughs> so they're like, oh, this is great. You know, Dennis is not disturbed at all. Thanks. And and so for some reason, what's her, Dizzy goes back to the house without John, who now has no car. And then... <laughs> she takes his car. Yeah, then That's the, the, John's then the bookstore guy goes, oh, no, no, no. Those are Dennis's crazy taxidermy books. And then, <laughs> of course, John's like... Oh no! Shit! Yeah. Then I got to get a car back home. Got to take a taxi. And then we're we're leading right into the we're heading right into the climax here. What's, what's that, John? John tells Pete to call the cops. He says, "Why? There's a crime in progress." <laughs> <laughs> Pete, you got to call the cops. I don't want to. Send them to my house. There's a crime in progress. Yeah, this is the most terrifying scene of the movie. Personally, I don't know about you guys. But we cut to a shot of John in the taxi sitting in the front fucking seat. (laughs) And I swear to fucking Christ, I diarrhea just shit myself. (laughs) That is absolutely fucking terrifying. What is he doing? (laughs) You always get weirded out. By the strangest things on this podcast. You There's remember... a social contract, Paul. You don't sit in the front <laughs> fucking seat of a taxi. And you don't use someone else's toothbrush. No! <laughs> I th- thank you, Jay. That's just what I was going to say. When you, you went off for 15 minutes in Psycho Betty's from Planet Pussycat because somebody used somebody else's toothbrush. It was disgusting. <laughs> and I'll save you from a 15-minute rant, but I'm telling you right goddamn now that you don't sit in the front seat of a fucking taxi. Noted. All right, move on. (laughs) (laughs) The stars fall down. Uh, Sorry, playing a pussycat on the Trying to channel that, huh? That's good. Oh, yeah. This is, uh, real quick, this is also where we sort of get the backstory of what happened to Dennis when him and John were kids. Do you want to touch on that, What? Yeah, like they got in a fight. John doesn't remember even what the fight was about, and he, Dennis ended up falling down the stairs. Dennis was going to be a genius. He's a he's a child prodigy. God damn it. And then after he get, falls down the stairs, now he's mentally challenged in a way that I don't think that's how that works. Well, no, Jay, nope. I gotta say though, they're leaving out. You'll find out in a few more minutes in this movie is that apparently John took a fucking baseball bat. To Dennis, was to it knock his baseball bat? Okay, so well, whatever. Yeah. Like, I thought it looked like. Well, that's the puppet show later. I was latched onto the mythology of the mom and the and Dennis when they were young, 
So then they did hint at this whole debt thing that, that John owes Dennis. But, I mean, at this point, it's like you're either in for the ride or you're not. So whatever. But it was, yeah, that was, so that's the thing. So baseball bat to the head. Now Dennis is uh, the current Dennis. Right. Uh, so Lydia is is at the mansion now, picking up Dennis for like to take him out to pizza or something because she decided that she likes him now. While John is stuck in traffic. <laughs> yes. While John is in the front seat of a taxi. Oh God. Um, <laughs> and she, inside the house, she hears a baby, and the baby is in a, this like old <laughs> stroller, sim- similar to the one, maybe the same stroller actually that you, that you see at the beginning of the film. And this is one of the coolest visuals, I think, in the, in the film. Yeah. Anybody remember oh, this yeah. right here? Yeah, it's a little baby crying, which you're like, cool, love that. That's great. Baby's crying. She opens the lid of the carriage, <laughs> and then it, it kind of zooms in or cuts into the face of the baby. And for one second, it's the baby. But then another second, <laughs> it's Dennis's face. And he comes up. He, like, stands up <laughs> as if he's been hiding inside of the stroller. And he stands up as it collapses ap- apart around him. And he comes up at her with a knife, you know. And he does a magic trick. Pretend, pretend to, yeah, the whole baby trick. <laughs> well, too, he does another magic trick with the knife. Oh, what does he do, Chris? Stabs her. <laughs> abracadabra. <laughs> Makes the knife disappear. Yeah, here's another missed opportunity. He does say abracadabra. It should have been abracastabia. I mean, <laughs> oh, yeah. God damn, well. It just shows the level of immaturity in the screenwriting. Those, yeah, those are the <laughs> sorts of jokes you don't get when you're on meth. <laughs> so yeah, Lydia like gets stabbed in the in the sort of the side or the stomach or something, and he brings her down to the basement where he's been he's been working on stuff down there. We don't know what he's been working on. And Jay, what does he do here with uh, a uh, power drill to Lydia? Oh yeah, thanks for reminding me of that. Um, Ugh, he forget. <laughs> drills out her head. Yeah. Takes that drill and just... And brains go flying and just cleans her brain right out. John gets home and he, I don't know, he hears some stuff coming from the basement or whatever, gets down to the basement, and this is where the movie truly goes off the rails with the sort of climactic scene that we get here uh, in the basement. Who wants to uh, help me out here a little bit, Chris? Animatronics, Paul. They're all animatronics. Yes, everyone. Um, Lydia, all the all the people that he's previously killed, Mildy and uh, the John's therapist is down there. They are all strung up in the basement uh, as sort of these animatronic puppets, and uh, Lydia is on Dennis's lap like a ventriloquist dummy. I don't remember this. Huh? Uh- I don't, I don't remember how John was knocked unconscious and glued to the chair. Oh, he wasn't. He sat down willingly. <laughs> he sat down willingly. He just, he followed a party streamer from the front fucking door. He gets down there. The basement door says, showtime. He Mike goes in. with the gun next to the sign. Yeah. yeah showtime yeah, in one minute. There's a gun. Picks up yeah. the gun. Follows the party streamer to the basement. Let's sit down. Kind of sees some weird shit and decides, well, oh, maybe maybe Dennis is going to put on a show. I'm going to have a seat in this nice recliner. Okay. Because I, I feel like I looked down and I looked up and I'm like, how does he get glued to this chair? He sits down and then, poof, you hear the pop of a spotlight <laughs> and then it's on them. He did not see them first. He sat down in a fucking chair. <laughs> <laughs> it's dream logic, Mike. He's in the fucking dream. I mean, but what we get here is an unbelievably intricate display here of this stage that Dennis has built in the basement and where everyone is it looks like a lot of like a combination of stop motion and like all these practical puppet effects taxidermy mm-hmm. a lot of taxidermy it, it it is visually pretty incredible in my opinion yeah he'll talk talk to me boy beautiful beautiful boy God damn it, Dennis! Foiled me out of his no, chair! No, not foiled, just a setback. We'll bring you back, and your brother will get his comeuppance. <laughs> well, and to be clear, this... Correct me if I'm wrong, but th- this is Dennis. I don't remember Berryman ever telling Dennis to build a stage show out of his <laughs> corpse victims. Make your own True. Well, well, at this Well, at this point, Berryman, the, the, the demon, is in the real world, and the real Dennis is in the mirror world. 
That's so, true. But Dennis had to be the one to build this. Dennis said, yeah, well, yeah, well, that knowledge of taxidermy, he's so skilled at it. Right. So <laughs> Dennis is not without fault here, in my opinion. No. Yeah, yeah true. There's yeah. a big spider monster in this that's all like a... But it's legs. All, yeah, made of legs. I, I, how many other people did he kill to get this many legs to make this? Because I don't mean one leg per spider leg. I mean, each spider leg had like five human legs shoved into each other <laughs> like ice cream cones. Yeah. Oh, God. God. <laughs> but so obviously John figures out that this is not a good situation at some point. Uh, but it's a little too late for him because he is super glued apparently to this uh, recliner yeah. down in the basement. Moral of the story here is never sit down at a recliner in a creepy basement. With with short sleeve shirt on. With short sleeve shirt on. <laughs> Lesson learned. Yeah. But uh, what happens here with uh, John, Chris? Uh, well, John struggles to get to free his arms. And instead of, and once he does get free, instead of, you know, running for his life or fighting off the giant animatronic spider made of legs... He decides to take the gun and shoot himself. He kills himself. It's the one way out. No real reason. Yeah, I guess that's the only way out. Uh, I don't know. Very sort of like the missed moment here. Because if he had just waited a little longer, right? Yes. <laughs> Like another minute. I don't even know if you watched the end of this, Jay. I did, but I honestly don't remember. I remember him. Sh I remember John shot himself. Yeah. I was really hard, like just zoned out. So it's all, it's almost like the ending to the mist. Yeah. Where yeah yeah. I exactly. just waited five more minutes. <laughs> Which is one of Jay's favorite endings of all time. It is one of my favorite endings of all time. And then a bunch of cops come in. They arrest Dennis. Pete from the bookstore had ca had called the cops. Oh, yeah, that makes sense now. Yeah, I'd wondered why they were yeah. there, but... Yeah, and then we get one sort of uh, epilogue scene here where... Uh, oh, yeah. Uh, Dennis is in an asylum, I guess, is one way to put it. Um, but is it him? You know? Are any of us really who we think we are? You know what I'm saying? Well, Dennis is like 20 mirror reflections down, apparently. Yeah, they zoom through right. all the mirror... the. Mirror and the mirror and the mirror and the mirror, and then you see the real Dennis stuck down there. Wild stuff. Credits. Yeah. Which, which, Paul, that reminds me that I think the only true way to know if you're in the real world or the fake world is how many first or second assistant cameramen you have in your credits. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, the credits I did glance up, and this is a little weird. Guess I'll have to end on that joke for rating time. <laughs> <laughs> rating time. Guys, there's a lot of different ways that we could go with this because there's so many strange little visual things in, in this movie. But I, this is the first thing that came to mind. We're going to do uh, one out of 100 vodka sodas with a splash of pineapple. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> All right. Wow. Because that is what uh, Lydia orders every time they are at their uh, yeah. usual hangout. Yeah. Sounds good. That's her drink. I want a drink. You? Definitely. Vodka soda, splash of pineapple, please. Refreshing. Chris, let's start with you. <coughs> <coughs> Off to a good start. I, Chris Hudson, of sound mind and hot body, hereby declare <laughs> this movie to be a fucking mixed bag. Ah, yeah. 60 straight up vodka on the rocks. Vodka's on, oh, vodka on the rocks. Yeah, yeah. I don't need the splash of pineapple. Okay, all right. It. Fair. Fair enough. Jay, let's get this out of the way. <laughs> uh, like, okay, like... <laughs> I didn't write anything so eloquent as Chris did. Um, well, you didn't write anything after the kids got killed, so that's not a surprise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, here's the thing, like... I almost don't want to rate this because I feel like it's just going to throw off the the, the score, and it may it, it may not be viewed as fair. No, just um, do it. But okay, look, <clears throat> yeah, if you put someone murdering children in your movie, you're not going to get a good score from me. Um, I don't know if it was what the guy was thinking when he did it, because you know there's a lot of addiction involved and a lot of craziness and a lot of time. I don't know. I don't even care. Um, 
I will tell you, I would rather watch a Josh Kirby. Oh, because, God. Wow. wow. Because Uh-oh. I found it to be... Uh, there's no likable <laughs> characters, in my opinion. I think the visuals are... There are some great visuals. I will not take that away from it. There's some very creative stuff there. There's some great cinematography, technically. But I just found the what was going on in the story to be so repulsive that I, I just was like, I'm done with this. So and, and to be clear, I don't like fault you, Paul, for picking it. Like I know it'd been a few years since you've seen it, and there's some interesting things, and it generated some interesting conversations. So I, I'm, I'm fine having watched it. Um, five. Wow. <laughs> Jesus. Wow. Sorry. Wow. I mean, that's um, honest. I, I mean, I, I was so damn. turned off by uh, some of the stuff that was going on. I, I can't help it. Well, before we get to Mike, real quick. I don't think uh-huh. it's fair. I have to say this. I don't think that's fair because I understand why you don't like the parts of the movie that you don't like. Yeah. I wasn't crazy about it either by any means. But that is, uh, I mean, we're talking about maybe a two-minute scene tops in the entire thing. Uh, I mean, there's other stuff that plays into that, though. With the cats and everything? Well, and just the utter lack of attempt at resistance. And then, like I said, I get why he wrote it the way he did. I see how it's constructed, and then if you remove a piece, a lot of the other pieces fall apart. But I didn't care for any of those pieces. <laughs> so, so I, I mean, that's why I said I almost didn't want to rate it, because <laughs> I feel like it will throw it off, and I can see why you say that it's not fair, but that's my, that's my rating. I mean, I don't care about the little... Uh maniac average at the bottom like that whatever that doesn't what? bother me i'm That's saying i don't care part. if this gets a, lo- a lower average than than you know than I, other okay stuff, well whatever. i mean and that's fine you can i mean i'm totally open to this dialogue and you defending the movie and that's probably got a lot of value for people who might want to check it out and think i'm full of it that's that's okay mm-hmm. But I don't I'm think just you're, saying, I'm not saying that you're full of it. I'm no, no just I know. Saying, I'm just saying, like, the reason... I'm I'm trying to explain the reason I feel so strongly about it and why... I mean, just why that's my score. So, I, I mean, I get it. I get what you're saying. And and feel free to call me on it if you don't think it's fair. No, it's fine, Mike. Oh, How about I, some balance quick, here, Michael? Uh, oh, yeah, I'm going to be... I have... A, I'm just telling you, I have a very perfectly balanced thing. But I do want to say, Jay, I do think you're full of it. And by it, I mean love. <laughs> um, Thanks, Mike. <laughs> you just went one mirror closer to my heart. Yes. Uh, okay. So anyway, so the visuals of this movie are uh, pretty good. You know, cinematography is pretty great. The practical stuff's cool. We've all kind of said all this stuff. Um, I I really think the idea of doing some short stuff would have been really cool. I think the long form it turned into really drug. Uh, and, uh, you know, don't take this out of context. I was fine with the kid killing. I thought it was an effective scene. Um, in the same, in It'll the be same our audio way. audio sample for the week. Yeah. In, <laughs> no. In the same way that, um, oh, like, Human Centipede is an effective film. I don't like the movie, but it is an effective right. film. It is gross. It is terrifying. I think that was the same way. I think they shot it pretty effectively without being gory. It creeped the fuck out of Jay, obviously. It was an effective scene. Uh, but I but I think some people do like this kind of stuff. They like the this kind of edgelord kind of thing. So... Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm just gonna be real balanced about this thing and give it a fifty. Wow, five zero, <laughs> right in the middle. Okay. I'm the high one so far. What the fuck? Yeah, very nice. Well, you know what's interesting? I would definitely rather watch this again more than Never Too Young to Die. <laughs> so that sort of what? shows you where we're at. Oh, hey, God. that's Paul's on thing. the scale here. That's yeah. fine. Tell you what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to give this a fucking 108.6 or whatever the hell Mike did. <laughs> oh, you're referring God to Hall of Fame inductee, Never Too Young to Die. <laughs> Son of a bitch. I am still thinking about starting a petition to have that officially, that score officially removed from, from canon. Wow. Oh, but, we've got some future controversy. Uh, for, for the evil within, I'm going to go 78 <laughs> vodka sodas with just a just a splash of pineapple nice well you know maybe somebody that's going through our website and hasn't listened to the podcast which you know happens all the time 
Mm -hmm. they're going to come across this episode and they're going to say, wait a minute, wait a minute. There is a range here from 5 to 78. I got to check this out. (laughs) Yeah. And two in the middle ones, right? Right. So So this, this this controversy among us could actually get this episode and the movie more views. Mm -hmm. And if so, we thank you. I prefer it, actually, when we have some disagreement on on this stuff. That just makes it more interesting. Yeah, well, fuck you, Paul. On the next episode of B-Movie Mania. This was a pretty heavy movie, right? I think we can all agree on that. A little bit. A little Um, bit. I need a little bit of levity. Mm. And there is a B-Movie icon that... We have never even, to my recollection, referenced on this show, and I want to fix that. Whoa. So I want us to watch Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. Wow. Yes! Wow. Oh, my. I've never seen this. I've um, never seen I think, it. I think we'll have some fun with it. Yeah. You know, a lot of, lot of jokes, mm-hmm, a lot mm-hmm. of Elvira. I can think of two reasons I'm going to have fun with it. <laughs> well, to, okay. I did look for Elvira's Haunted Hills because I have seen Mistress of the Dark before and I have not seen Haunted Hills, but that one's a little bit harder to find and it's not streaming. Uh, Mistress of the Dark is free on Amazon Prime or Tubi, so you have choices here. Very nice. Mm Mm-hmm. Listen up, maniacs. Do you have a question or a comment? Would you like to uh, send some bourbon to Uncle Lloydie? You can contact the gang on Facebook at B Movie Mania. You can also drop them a line at bmoviemania.com. Reach out, touch them. They are touching themselves, and they might just reach back. I'm Lloyd Kaufman saying, see you next time on B Movie Mania. Woohoo! Uh, if you would like to add a little levity to our situation, why don't you buy a t-shirt on store.bmoviemania.com. We got, we yeah. still got the new Slade Craven shirt up there. We got hoodies. We got uh, different designs that you can choose from, different colors. It's pretty cool, right, Mike? Yeah, that Slade Craven shirt. Also, there's three different designs. There's a unisex tee. Uh, there's something called the ladies' favorite tee, which is more of a trim cut. And we also got tank tops. Um, and they are all on sale still. Nice. So, you know, save a few bucks. Pick up one of these Slade Craven shirts for the for the summer. Jay, you like yours? You've been wearing yours? Oh, yeah. I wear mine constantly. It's really comfy. Constantly. I've got the Slade Craven underwear, Paul. <laughs> oh, yeah? Oh, cool. yeah? Next up is the Slade Craven Chuck Strap. <laughs> great, great job on the design, Mike. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, Paul designed it. I just put the placement right on, you know. Thanks for putting it on. Yeah, thanks to both of you. Um, if you want to add another type of levity to uh, us, uh, you could give us a, a rating, a review. Uh, well, <laughs> you can't review us, Paul. <laughs> you can't review us, Paul. Um, I give Mike a 98. <laughs> oh, God damn it, guys. <laughs> Go to iTunes, rate us, leave a review if you want, but mostly just click those stars would be really helpful and it's real easy, and it helps people find out about the podcast. So it's cool if you do that. No doubt. Yeah. And then also follow us on social media. You can find us all around. We get around Twitter, yes. we're on Instagram, we're on the Facebook. Yes. We'll post a bunch of shit. Uh, yes. It's a fun time. Interact with us, like yes. Uncle Lloydie said. What, is he, what are you yes. doing, Chris? Oh, God. I'm agreeing with you. <laughs> Oh, do everything Mike said. I thought you were being that 45-year-old son masturbating. Well, <laughs> he's 30. Chris has the type of family with the 45-year-old baby masturbating. Oh, God. <laughs> that, too. I mean, come on. <laughs> oh, God. And he's looking in the mirror, too. Uh, I gotta go, guys. It's I gotta masturbating go. upon masturbating no. upon masturbating no. upon masturbating upon <laughs> masturbating upon <laughs> masturbating upon <laughs> masturbating. Hey, guys. If we were to rate each other, what would the rating scale be? I'm turning this off. Masturbatory reflection. Hey, listener, by listener. God damn. <laughs> oh, fuck me. Good night, everybody. <laughs> Goodbye. Very nice. Yes, thank God. Parting of the Red Sea was okay, but I was not a believer until I witnessed the bookstore fuck up. <laughs>